Welcome to another episode of Tea Time. And today on the sofa, I've got a really interesting person that I'm going to be catching up with. Um, and a lot of you may know her already. And she goes by the name of DJ Copy. Thank you so much for joining me Thank you today. for having me. Thank you for letting me into your wonderful office. It's great being here. Um, <laughs> Would you consider yourself um, an entertainer now, or would you consider yourself solely a DJ? I've always been an entertainer, because DJs, we entertain. But I feel like now, you know, my artistry is coming out. And, you know, as a DJ, I feel like we've always been making our own music. Just mixing two songs in itself is making music. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, there's nothing sweeter than dropping that original record. I feel like I have more control and command yeah, over my absolutely. work. With Greenlight, uh, Techno and I wanted to work together for a long time. And when we finally got together, I thought we were going to do more, what most DJs and artists do, which is, OK, Techno, do you have a record you're not using? Let's just slop Jump on, on DJ Copy in the beginning of the song, and then that's it. But Techno was like, no, 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 Copy. We need to be in the studio. We need to create something. Um, you know, so we, I started going to the studio getting comfortable with that environment. Techno insisted on us producing the beat from scratch. I was playing him loads of beats from producers. He was like, no, 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 no. So we were playing around and, you know, we created this beat, you know, and then we ended up writing this great song. And I remember him saying, I was just playing around. I love your green light, baby, pom pom. And then he was like, oh, can you just quickly go and record that in the booth? I was like, he was like, don't worry. I'll sing it my own version mm -hmm. later, just so we don't forget. Oh, wow. And he never removed my voice. And that was And that's made. it. Tell me a little bit about yourself in terms of your background and how it's influenced your music so far. Um, I was born in Lagos um, and I feel like anyone born in Lagos will tell you how dynamic, colorful that is. Absolutely. There's never a boring day. Mm -hmm. There's always something. You know, I had an amazing childhood. I had very supportive parents. Um, and I feel like, you know, my parents always pushed me to do something, you know. I had piano lessons, I had swimming lessons, I had cooking lessons, even though I can't cook. But, <laughs> you know, they really, really just wanted me to be just skilled, you know. And growing up as well, you know, I actually never really felt like, you know, being a woman was something that would make me feel different, you know. Uh, I have three sisters and, you know, my dad always felt, you know, in a household full of women, you know, he always felt like, um, you know, women were just like anybody else. So I grew up very much outspoken. I was very young, but I had very strong opinions. Um, and, you know, both my parents are so entrepreneurial. So from day one, I saw what it was like to build businesses. Um, they both started both of their businesses uh, when I was around, you know, I would say 10 years old. So I've gone through several stages in my life where, you know, my parents have been able to sow seeds and I've seen these seeds come mm. to fruition. So I've always seen the essence of hard work, you know, and how it can reward you long term. Um, and I moved to London when I was about 16 years old. Actually, no, not 16, maybe 14. And it was a very sudden move, you know? Um, and I remember missing Nigeria so much. So what I did was um, I used music as an escape when I was feeling homesick. Mm. Um, you know, those horrible cold yeah. winters. Um, and I wasn't even in London, actually. I was kind of, I was a little bit um, east. I was in Canterbury, in Canterbury. those cold Dover winds. Um, so yeah, so music was my escape. And I remember feeling so different from all the other children. You know, the food was bland. I didn't like playing hockey. You know, I didn't want to um, eat fish and chips. You know, it was, I loved home, I missed it. So um, music really got me through that time. I was away from my parents, my friends, everything I knew. And so from that time, music was a very, very big part of my life. Um, I remember a very long time ago, you were known as, I mean, there was an affiliation between you and Cupcakes. And yeah. And you've got Red Velvet music. Yes. What is the link with you and Kate? What I love, so again, growing up, I loved Cupcakes. Um, I was a bit of a chubby child. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I always craved Cupcakes. So uh, people used to call me Cupcake anyway. Cupcake, Cupcake. And um, so when it came to that moment, being 16 years old, choosing a DJ name, you know, everyone's like, oh yeah, Cupcake. So I was like, I'm DJ Cupcake. Uh, and, but obviously, you know, as I grew into my brand, um, you know, Cupcake was not sustainable. 
and I did feel like people didn't take that name very seriously. And I also wanted to evolve and people were calling me nicknames from Cupcake itself and Cuppy was one of them and I guess I'm DJ Cuppy now. Kind of stuck. Um, kind of stuck, yeah. yeah, but my favorite flavor of cupcakes has always been red velvet. You guys should try it That's if you best. haven't, yeah. it's delicious. Um, and so I named my company, my management company, Red Velvet Music Group. Um, and yeah, it's, you know, I love it. I've built structure, I've matured, I'm 25 years old now, but I've kept consistency and everything is still, everything still directly identifies with me Absolutely. and my story. And then just moving on to, you know, more, more of the music things. Yes. Well. How did you let your parents know that you wanted to be a DJ? I mean, it's not a conventional <laughs> Nigerian route, career route to take, you know what I mean? Like, no, it's not. Living in England and that kind of thing. How did you break it to them? And how did they um, it? So, you know, I, has, I had started DJing at 16. For my birthday, I asked my, my parents for decks. You know, so they got me some secondhand decks. And I, over the summer, I just locked myself in my room, teaching myself how to DJ, you know. I think it was very annoying for everyone else in the house. I must have sounded horrible, you know, but obviously practice makes perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm a lot better than I used to be. They were aware that I loved music and, you know, they, they understood that music was very important to me. Even when I look back at school, like I was always doing anything to do with creativity, I was good at. You know, I mean, I still was very good at the more, I guess, um, academic stuff, <laughs> academic stuff. I have a, you know, I have an economics degree from King's College London. So yeah, I'm not, you know, kind of, <laughs> kind of a little bit intelligent, but, you know, I just loved creativity. And so, you know, when I said, guys, mom and dad, I'm DJ Copy now, you know, they were like, oh, gosh, you're... they thought it was another phase because I wanted to be an ice skater. I wanted to be a banker. I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be an astronaut, oh, I wanted gosh. to be everything. So they were like, okay, cool. And, you know, I guess, what, um, nine years later, it's my profession, you know, but they were nothing but supportive. And I always tell people this, that ask, I always remember this moment. My dad said to me, you know what, Ife, which is my Nigerian name, um, if you want to be a DJ, that's fine, but anything worth doing is worth doing. Doing well. Right? So I made sure that I didn't stop my DJing from, you know, allowing me grow as a young adult, allowing me to do what I needed to do, which was go to school, go to university. And I don't allow it change or influence my lifestyle. I'm still me, you know, and at the end of the day, it's really important. It's, I, am seeing, I am seeing how hard it is to balance being in entertainment and being, you know, having a life. It's difficult. But my parents are very good at that, you know. So I'm copy to you guys, but at home I'm Ife. And um, Ife gets told off sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and moving, obviously you've been quite an ambition, ambitious person. You just mentioned you want to be an astronaut, a doctor and yes. that kind of thing. Um, obviously you've, went, you've been to um, NYU, you've yes. been to King's College, yes. prestigious King's College London. Um, and also you've interned at Rock Nation. Yes. Which, was, which was, must have been amazing. How was that? It was. Um, so when I went to New York, I... I I got, in, um, I got into New York University for my master's. I decided I wanted to do a master's in music and you know, New York University offered the best course. So I worked very hard and I got in. And um, it's so, just so beautiful. I, I just all of a sudden just managed to bag this, this internship at Rock Nation at Jay-Z's company. And everyone asks me, have you met Jay-Z? Yes, I have met Jay-Z. He actually, on my second day at work, he walked in the room like that. Oh, how lucky. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> you know, but again, he's a human being. And these are people that are just what I love about surrounding myself with these people. These kind of people are just how business minded they are, mm. you know. Um, but my time at Rock Nation was amazing. I got to help them um, lay the foundations and the routing for their Rock Nation Africa project. You know, I was definitely that annoying African in the office. Guys, listen to this, listen to that. You know, and it was really good for me to step away from the limelight Absolutely. and be behind the scenes. And a lot of my knowledge from Rock Nation, I brought into RVMG, Red Velvet Music Group. You know, and I now, Rock Nation really made me realize, at the end of the day, Cuppy is a product. It's a commercial brand, so I'm running a business. So I mustn't forget that. It's not just for entertainment, but it's the same way Jay-Z has been able to create a legacy and you know create new artists that will also have legacies it's a beautiful thing so i feel like i'm here talking to you because 
I've been given an opportunity, so I must give the same opportunity to others. I mean, it's no doubt that you've definitely put Africa on the map. I watched your um, Breakfast Club with Charlemagne yes. the God, and I was so pleased <laughs> that you were able to educate and inform Charlemagne him. Charlemagne is very hard. He's actually, you know, people always ask me, Cuppy, are you nervous about interviews? I'm like, once you get into Charlemagne, Charlemagne, anyone else is a breeze. Um, but yeah, I, I'm always, I feel like I'm an advocate for Africa. You know, I love, 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 and I'm so proud of where I'm from. I couldn't even hide it if I tried, mm. you know? So regardless of what I do, I'm always repping. And then I just wanted to talk about, you know, your music. I've listened to your, I think it was your first ever mix um, with the, is it the Kelani guy? Um, it was the one that had the bit of the house and then we've moved on to Afrobeats. It was the one that had the infusion of both. Okay. But I wanted, I, I think it was a very long time ago. It was like oh, wow. back, back in like 2011 yes, or yes, something. Yes, yes, but um, I wanted to know how your kind of cultural background from Nigeria, yes. your educational background from England, and then obviously academically, sorry, from England, and then, yes. you know, your kind of social background and going to America and yes. going to all different parts of yes. Europe. How has it influenced your music and how hard has it been? Because I know, you know, I will also watch the interview with DJ Branty. I grew, I grew up in London, so I kind of yes. know how hard it is to kind of merge the two cultures. Yes. What has been your biggest challenge in kind of infusing that part yeah, of you? Um, you know, it's so interesting you ask that because I'm also right now in a crossroad where, you know, um, I'm in the studio and I'm trying to make music I love, but I'm also trying to make music that I feel like people will love. And there's a divide between both. You know, I want to make pure Afrobeat music, but my heart is also in the international scene. You know, being in London, I fell in love with house. Yeah. Being in New York, I fell in love with hip hop. You know, and it's difficult, you know, and it's also difficult when, um, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't go to a show like this anymore, but I remember when I first started DJing, they would say, no, we don't want any Afrobeats. And, you know, now I'm obviously more comfortable in my skin and I'm more, you know, I'm more, I guess I'm more qualified as a DJ, as a profession. So now my clients respect my song choice, but, you know, yeah, sometimes you battle with it because there's, Sometimes there's making money and there's making music mm. and they can be very separate. Did you find it hard trying to please both crowds? Because I know obviously London there's a huge African diaspora yeah. community who love Afrobeats, yeah. but then you also have, you know, the highbrow kind of English people that want to listen to house all the time. Yes. Did you find it very difficult trying to kind of find a niche for yourself? Yes, I mean, definitely. I've had to make a choice and I, I chose to be authentic, you know, and I haven't really DJed as much as I used to around Europe. I haven't done as many, you know, I guess, I've done international gigs, but I haven't done, you know, kind of like as far as London, scene gigs, you know what I mean? Like mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or I haven't done scene gigs in New York because I believe my priority is to put Africa on, on the map. It already is, but I'm an advocate. It's like an, I'm an ambassador. ambassador. You know, I've made myself one, unofficially. <laughs> Honorary. <laughs> Honorary. So, you know, for me, it's about sending the message. And I don't really care whether I would make more money otherwise. Um, but I've decided, you know, I, I'm going to do what makes me happy. And moving on to kind of more of the kind of career and music career as, as a whole. Mm -hmm. I've seen the Channel 4 documentary, the... Yes. Uh, you know, everything, you keep bringing things up that I've completely... That you've done oh, like, a long time ago. I'm like, oh, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a long time ago. I think it was back was in 2015. Two, two years ago. Like, two years ago, two years 2016 ago, yes. then. Um, uh, how did you Lagos find... To London, the Lagos yeah. to London. I think it featured um, Alexander... I've forgotten his surname. Amosu. Amosu yes. and Natokia Makiwan and the likes. How did you find your representation of that? Because I, I found it was quite mixed. Yeah. How did you feel about it? Um, with that piece, I was wasn't exactly ecstatic because I felt like I was slightly misrepresented. Yeah, I agree. But, I mean, I'm willing to take that because anything that makes Africa look good, you know, I'm down with. So for me, it was nice to show people... A different side. ...that actually we don't live in mud huts. We actually are educated. Mm. We know how to have a good time. You know, we're social people, we're confident people. <laughs> you know, and we have big, big ambitions. And if that's going to be displayed at the cost of, you know, my, um, my, I don't know. I don't know. What was the perception? I think a lot of people thought I came across as being a show off or people th thought I came, came across as, you know, I, someone said, oh gosh, like 
yeah, you know, I don't really think Cuppy works hard and I work so hard, mm. you know, but, and it was a shame because I did feel like it was edited in a certain way, but that's showbiz, you know, it's the industry I chose. Moving on to kind of more challenges and backlashes that yes. you get, I mean, I'm sure you're aware everyone kind of thinks, you know, the shadow of your father, the influence of your father. How has that, you know, how has it been a blessing and a challenge for you at the same mm. time? Um, you know, I'm very, the association with my father, yeah, it's a gift and a curse at the same time. But I'm very good at um, balance. Um, okay, for example, we just spoke about this Channel 4 show. Um, and I think that was very well balanced with, I had my own show, Copy Takes Africa, mm. which showed me going on tour to eight different African countries and doing what I do best. Performing and doing philanthropy, those are my two favorite things in the world to do. And so with my father's case, you know, I see how um, my father, at the end of the day, you know what, first of all, he's my father, right? And it's, when I was growing up, I remember I used to almost feel embarrassed about who my father was and I, people don't believe me, but because people would, you know, use it against me or it would change their, per their perception. perception. So, you know, but now I'm super proud because I've realized that actually, you know, again, he's a human being. And yes, I know my father is this phenomenal um, entrepreneur and I'm so proud to be his daughter, but he's also my father. We have a, you know, a daughter and father relationship. You know, we, he tells me off, we sometimes argue, you know, it's not at home, it's not Femi or Tedola and Kapi sitting on a couch, you know, doing this. <laughs> you know, we're, we're human beings, you know. And so um, it's very hard to, to, I have to figure out a way of, you know, of having this very, being a very public person and having this very public father, you know. Um, but I really, really pay no mind to what people say. I'm actually, I'm so blessed to have, I don't know, you know, when people say they have thick skin, I have like really thick skin. Um, and I'm just so confident in myself and I do what makes me happy. So it really deters what, you know, anyone trying to ruin my day. Um, and I put myself out there and it comes at a price, you know, it's part of, it's a responsibility I have as someone in the public eye. Um, you know, it's just, people are going to talk and people will have their opinions. You know, I always laugh when celebrities are like, oh, poor me. Oh. <laughs> you know, it comes with the job, it comes with mm. the territory. So, you know, um, if you can't stand the heat, get, get out of the kitchen. kitchen. You know what they say. <laughs> you know what they say. I wanted to ask you as well, in terms of like, you know, you know, we've spoken about your dad, we've spoken about the music and, and so on. What's your best memory? Because I've seen, I mean, for me, the, I think the height of your career for me was well, MTV for starters. I mean, that was oh, huge. Yeah. I was actually 19 at the time. Exactly, really I was young. I resident DJ for the MTV Awards. Yeah, which is, and then also you got to meet President Macron. Oh, yeah, I as got well. to teach him how to DJ. How to DJ, how I was that? To, that was phenomenal. Um, I'm an ambassador for Global Citizen, which is a big uh, organization. Rihanna is also an ambassador. So we both actually went to Dakar, Senegal, and um, the presidents of Senegal and France were hosting an event. And after the event, I was just DJing, and Macron walks past and he stops. You know, he's like, oh, a female DJ. DJ. You know, and luckily I speak French, so we had a lovely chat and I was teaching him how to DJ. It was an amazing moment. Um, and then another great moment was um, when I got to DJ for the Nigerian um, presidential inauguration. So that felt really good, um, DJing for President Buhari. And I DJed for the Ghanaian President Shimon Oh yeah, I saw that actually. Which yeah. was amazing, um, and it was great. I played Ghanaian music all night. Um, they must have loved that. They yeah, loved yeah. it. I mean, I think a few people were questioning why there was a Nigerian, Nigerian DJ, <laughs> but you know what, we all, Africa is one. I would say another amazing highlight in my career um, has been, um, oh, I got to give a speech to the um, to the, I think it was, is it the Prime Minister? Yeah, the Belgian Prime Minister. And, oh um, and he tweeted that, oh, Copy is my partner in crime because he loved my music. Oh, nice. Yeah, and um, Elton John has kissed my hand before. Oh, wow. You know, it's amazing how DJing just opens doors. Doors, yeah. Um, but I, I have so much more I hope to achieve. But these things just happen and it's like an amazing, you know, I'm just amazing. I love mm. my job. I couldn't think of anything else I would want to do. 
Absolutely, I mean, ugh, you make my life seem so boring. Uh, has your experience been like being a young female DJ? They're like, someone's gonna have a problem with you anywhere you go in the world. So yeah. what, what is, what's that been like for I you? I mean, being a young female DJ, I, to be honest, just being me, I've, I've just constantly been working against odds. You know, whether it's being a female, whether it's being young, or sometimes whether it's being black, you know? I've experienced sexism, racism, ageism. I always say once. wherever you, when you're a black woman, wherever you go in the world, someone will have a problem with you, either yes. because you're a woman, because you're black. But yes, once in a while there comes along this person that, you know, explains and wants to let us all know that women can't do as well as men, you know, or there's this other male DJ that wants to be difficult. Oh, why is Cuppy DJing after me? Oh, oh, why does Cuppy get this? You know, and I just don't let it get to me. I just believe that anything men can do as women, we can do it better. better. And we just have to work twice as hard but we have twice as much strength. I wanted to know more about your experiences as you know, you kind of discussed, you know, how sh the challenges of being a female DJ, but I've seen you all over the billboards. Pepsi, how yes. did that go? Um, yeah, no, I'm really proud. I'm a Pepsi DJ ambassador. Um, you know, it's my first endorsement and it's amazing being associated with such a global brand. Especially at this time, the World Cup's been massive. Nigeria's been, yes, you know, yes. the best jersey and, and yeah, so on. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing, you know, going, I went to the supermarket, opened the fridge and my face was on the bottles. You know, it's amazing. I, and I'm, I, I'm just so blessed and I'm the only female DJ, of course. Mm. And, you know, I feel like it's a new dawn and I, I hope other organizations follow Pepsi in recognizing that, you know, we need more women involved. You must get an unlimited supply of Pepsi. Oh yeah, I uh, mean, Pepsi for everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> Way <laughs> After Pepsi. this interview. <laughs> and moving on to your philanthropy, I mean, you've mentioned that, you know, two aims in life, obviously to do really well at what you're passionate about and also to obviously give back. Yes. I know you've got a foundation, the Cuppy yes. Foundation. How did that come about and what inspired you to do that? So the Cuppy Foundation has been a project I've been working on for a long time. Um, like I said, philanthropy is important to me. I feel like, gosh, you know, like I said, someone has worked hard and given me an opportunity, hence I'm sitting here with you now, so I must do the same. I think it's the least I can do. Um, so I decided that I wanted to, you know, I want to be a huge DJ, I want to be successful, but I also wanted to leave something behind. So I decided that, um, I need to start sowing some seeds. Um, you know, I was really proud to announce around April that I would be sending 10 students to university covering all their costs. And um, I'm really proud of it, you know, I've been able to do that. And I launched my foundation officially um, in August um, this month. And, you know, it's been such an amazing opportunity to meet my beneficiaries. Um, I'm sure as you can imagine, I get many on a daily basis. I probably, I haven't shared this with anyone, but I reckon I get about like a hundred people asking for help. A day? A day. That's, That's wild. That's a fact. Yeah. I can prove that. You know, so rather than, you know, going through all my messages, my letters, my emails, my DMs, I decided that, you know, um, I think it's important as a young person to make sure that I'm, I'm making a difference. And I was just going to ask that, like, what's next? Like, yeah, what's next gosh, for DJ Copy? Um, I have also this amazing project which is called Cactus on the Roof. I've been, they're really You've good. Been yeah, where? yeah, yeah, yeah. Battersea in London. Oh, in London, yeah. was it fun? Yeah, it was really good. It was, it was amazing. Like, <laughs> it was good. I was actually really surprised. I wasn't expecting it to be that great because I was just thinking oh, I was going to be another London like vibe, but it actually superseded my expectation. So well done. I'm well glad. Done. <laughs> well, there you have it. I did not ask her to say that. <laughs> um, yeah, so Cactus on the Roof, you know, for those that don't know, it's my resident party. So. I take this party around, you know, so it was in London this summer. I'm you bought it to Lagos, haven't you? Bringing it to yeah. Lagos. Um, and it's this Afrobeat tropical party. And the reason I created that is I remember I wanted to do, there was a certain rooftop in London and I really wanted to DJ there. And they said, you can DJ, but you're not allowed to play Afrobeats. We just want house music. And me just being me was like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to play it. My own. <laughs> and I'm so proud it's grown, you know, and I mean, it's it's so exciting to see this project and it's really exciting because I have an all-female team and it's so beautiful to see how this little idea has turned into a brand of its own. So I'm going to be uh, continue, I'm going to continue growing Cactus. So Cactus on the Roof coming to a ceiling at you. Do you have any kind of word of advice for anyone that's young and as anyone that's a female that's trying to aspire to kind of, you know, be a DJ or be anything really? Like what, what would be your kind of 
you know, your two pence for someone out there? I mean, my advice would be, you know, to have passion. I have friends that actually have jobs that they're not very happy with and you won't, it's so hard to, to be good at something that you don't want to do. No matter how much you try, no matter how hard you study, it's so hard. So live a passion driven life and whatever you do, do it well, right? If, you know, be prepared to work hard, but also think big. Find a job you love and never work a day in your life. Absolutely, I'll take a leaf out of your book. Thank you so much for joining Thank me. It's been having nice you. having you <laughs> and speaking to you. And thanks for inviting us over. Thank you, it's Thank been you. great.